Greetings and welcome to Mental Health Trailblazers, Psychiatric Nurses Speak Up. I am your host, Andreas Kasai. This is the Minority Fellowship Program at the American Nurses Association's podcast, featuring the groundbreaking journeys of Black, Indigenous, and other peoples of color, psychiatric, and mental health nurses in their quest to meet the urgent and unmet needs of minority communities in America. We are so excited to talk to today's guest, so let's get started. Dr. Gonzalez Guarda, welcome to Mental Health Trailblazers, Psychiatric Nurses Speak Up. Let me start by asking you to introduce yourself to our audience. And uh, if you could also tell us why you got into nursing in the first place and psychiatric and mental health nursing in particular. Thank you so, so much for the opportunity to talk about this. My name is Rosa Gonzalez Guarda, and I'm an associate professor at the School of Nursing at Duke University. And my background is as a nurse scientist and a public health nurse. And originally I went into nursing after an experience that I had in the Dominican Republic, where I had the opportunity to work with Haitian immigrants that were coming into the Dominican Republic to work on sugarcane fields. Mm -hmm. And in that work, I had the opportunity to work with these sisters that were actually public health nurses. And they were addressing the social drivers of health in that population. So one of the first things that that really motivated me to do this work was observations around health disparities and inequities and how those translate into health in this community that I was having the opportunity to work with. And then, then also comparing it to my own experience of how I had the good fortune of just being born in a particular community in Miami where I had all this access to resources that would help me thrive, Mm -hmm. um, where I was part of of the majority group. You know, I I identify as Hispanic Latina and I grew up in a community which was a enclave and where I didn't grow up feeling like I was a minority or other than the major group. And so Mm. when I went to the Dominican Republic and experienced work with Haitian immigrants that were experiencing racism through their work and in their country in the Dominican Republic, I was really motivated to do some work addressing those social drivers of racism that ultimately influence access to resources. And so in, I decided to to go to nursing school and, and I had a focus on wanting to do global health. And at the more opportunities I had to work with local communities and in particular minoritized community, I realized that a lot of these inequities that I first saw in the Dominican Republic are things that I see here in the United States. And they're more, they're almost more in just given the access to resources. And Absolutely. ultimately that impacts our mental health and our well-being. Absolutely. And I um, mean, thank you for that introduction. And I didn't know that you had done research in the Dominican Republic. What are your thoughts when you see the images that have been coming out on media in the past few days with the situation on the border and the treatment of Haitian immigrants? Yeah, it's a major issue. And I think it's it's not only... You know, we're seeing images now recently, but, you know, it, it's something that I grew up experiencing or witnessing even in my own community in South Florida, where we, you know, had many friends that yeah. were um, of Haitian ancestry. And there again, it plays out again and again, issues related to racism and structural racism that exist through our policies. And so one of the interests I have is trying to move my work to address some of that. I was kind of digressing there, but it is something that has been very stark. I mean, it definitely is a trigger, those images. And I think if it's a trigger for somebody like me, who's, who's here in you know the suburbs of Washington, D.C., I'm also a, a, an immigrant, um, you know, but, but by the grace of God, there go I. It's I imagine something that impacts on the mental health of especially African-American men who uh, have been subjected to this continuous barrage, if you will, of dehumanizing imagery all set within this system that is that has been 
almost designed from the start to to put them down. I think it, it's an important point. A lot of your research has been on minority communities, the health disparities, health impacts, and uh, psychomental health uh, issues that they face. But you haven't focused exclusively on your own Latina or Latino Hispanic community. You've also done work with African American communities and with Asian American communities. Why is that? And, and what what have you learned through that process? And if there are tips that you might have to share for people who are not from a certain community who might want to do research with a, you know in another community, what are the mistakes that researchers typically make and how can they avoid those pitfalls? You know, I think I started my work originally focused on my community. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I did do that is because I started observing, you know, in uh, the big gaps in research in my own community as I was trying to work in that community. I always felt that it's important to work in your own backyard first before moving on to other places. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my mother always told me, you can't be a light on the street and darkness in the house, right? You have to really start and do put invest, right? You have to invest your resources in your own home. And I first realized actually when I was in DC and I moved out of Miami, the disparities that exist in the Latinx community outside of a place, a geography where there's a history of leadership of Latinx leaders, you know? So <laughs> in, in Washington, DC, for example, and here in North Carolina, it's a more recent Latinx immigrant receiving community. And so the disparities that we see are even more drastic than in a place like Miami or, or even in, in New York where there's more leaders, Latinx leaders, healthcare providers that can identify with that community. Mm -hmm. So I did start a lot of my work in, in, in my own community and in developing expertise on how to engage the Latinx community or communities in general, what were the important frameworks to use to address those imp important methods to use. I also had opportunities to work with other communities and largely a lot through the students that I've been able to mentor. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we experience, unfortunately, in nursing and in academia more broadly is that we don't have enough researchers and nurses that are from the diverse communities that we represent. Mm -hmm. And so often I've had opportunities to work with students that identify with other racial and ethnic and cultural groups because they feel that the work that I've done is aligned with the work and the approaches that they would like to do in their own communities. So I've had opportunities to, to do that. One of the roles that I have right now at the university is that I co-direct uh, engagement efforts mm -hmm. for our Clinical Translational Science Institute. And in that work, you know, we really focus on engagement and representation of diverse communities. And unfortunately, the African-American Black community, the Latinx community, and others in this area are vastly underrepresented in research. And so I've had opportunities to address those, those issues with diverse groups as well. And... Has there been pushback from these communities? I mean, they're underrepresented. And does that translate into resistance on their part or, you know, being suspicious of the system, if you will, and you as a researcher being part of that system? Yes, absolutely. Mm. And I think there's definitely some resistance because, unfortunately, researchers and our systems haven't gained that trustworthiness. We, we, we have a, a, a very shameful history of mm -hmm. mistreating people. You hear a lot about Tuskegee. It's, it's mm -hmm. also with the Latino community. Is that distrust there? It's a little different. Mm -hmm. It's a little different of the distrust. So, you know, back to your questions of working with across racial and ethnic groups, mm -hmm. I think that's an important point to make here is that it, different minoritized groups, they share some common struggles Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to learn from one another's struggles and the solutions that we've created. And then there's also some really unique struggles as well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so for the black community, race is uh, the racial history 
And sl- the history of slavery in this country is, is huge, yes. right? And the Latinx community who didn't have that same history here in the United States that are immigrants, they may have a shared history of Black Latinx individuals in the Caribbean, for example, or in Latin America, that is common. But mm-hmm. most of the communities, the Latinx communities, came here by choice. Mm-hmm. So the, that, that's a very different context mm-hmm. for this work. And so then going back to that question about resistance or reluctance or hesitation to be part of research, I think the history plays a role. In the Latinx community, the prominence of Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks, these very prominent stories of research misconduct with the Black community, that is not as pervasive, but the the reluctance comes down to fear of government, mm-hmm. particularly for Latinx individuals that are not documented. Mm-hmm. Um, another barrier is that the the Latinx community has very high uninsurance rates, mm-hmm. and so they're often not accessing healthcare. And a lot of times in research, we reach out to people that are patients and invite patients to be part of studies. And so Latinx people don't always have that same opportunity. But in general, the thing that we've discovered is that Latinx individuals and African-American and Black communities are very willing to be part of research studies if researchers really do make an effort to gain that trustworthiness of the community, to really reach out in ways that resonate with the community and align with their preferences and their strengths. Okay, then let me ask you about the importance of doing that, of having these culturally tailored research and then interventions. A lot of your work has focused on intimate partner violence, substance abuse, HIV, and mental health. Now, these are things that affect all racial groups in America. Mm -hmm. And so you would think that a, an, event, an intervention, a successful intervention that you uh, might apply to a white community would apply to a black community, would apply to a Latino community. Why is it important to have these culturally tailored interventions? What are they? I mean, is it just translating material into Spanish um, and or having, you know, a black person speaking it instead of a white person? Or is there something more? I think there's some something more mm-hmm. deeper to that. And at the root of it is understanding the why, what is driving intimate partner violence, what is driving HIV, what is driving mental health problems and substance abuse problems for each population. And they, they can share some common themes, but they configure in a, a unique way mm-hmm. according to, to communities. So I can just share and be, be more clear on that in the Latinx community. The thing that we have found that is the strongest driver, the strongest predictor of HIV risk behaviors and substance abuse and mental health problems and intimate partner violence is acculturation stress. And acculturation stress is the stress of being a Latinx immigrant in this country and adapting to this this new context. Being a Latinx immigrant in this country is very different than being a black immigrant in this country or an African-American that is not an immigrant. Hmm. There's some shared experiences of discrimination, but the way that that is experienced is slightly different, right? So for the Latinx immigrant population, which is the group that I'm working with right now, it's a intersection of discrimination that results from language issues if they're not proficient in Spanish. In English? I mean, in English, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's also related to the color of their skin. There's very many different shades in the Latinx community, so it's related to that. It's related to their experiences at work. Um, Many Latinx immigrants come and they're professionals in their countries, and then here they take on jobs that, that, you know, that, that are not aligned with their experiences and education levels, and that's a big source of stress for people. There's that stress of having, of coming in with some cultural values around family and what is right for kids to do. And then now kids are are being raised in the United States and they have different ideas of what they should yes. be able to do. And there's that conflict between the generations. And, and so if if you have a program to try to prevent mental health problems, HIV, substance abuse, and, and you don't really address those 
very salient issues that are present in people's lives day in and day out, then the potential impact of that of that intervention is minimal. So if you have a stress in intervention, you, you have, you're focused on stress and you don't speak to that unique experience of stress for each group, then the likelihood of that having an impact is, is minimized. And so when you are really um, aligned with those experiences that people have, then you have more of an opportunity to have an impact. And do you think this, this understanding is there within the healthcare system in general, perhaps in Miami, South Florida, where you have people who are from the same community that might be there, but, uh, you know, somebody who's in, in another state, um, places where you don't have many, uh, healthcare providers of Latino descent or background. Are healthcare providers cognizant of this? I think that now more than ever, healthcare providers are recognizing blind spots related to the lack of diversity that we have in the healthcare professional workforce. And unfortunately, this past two years with COVID disparities that we're seeing mm -hmm. and an increased recognition of systemic racism, people are starting to open their eyes and they're starting to invest more in learning and reaching out. An example of this is during the pandemic here in the Research Triangle area, there was very vast health disparities that we saw in the Latinx community. There was actually a point in the pandemic last year, last summer, where about 80% of the cases of COVID were among Latinx people, while they only represent 14% of the population here in Durham. Wow. So, wow. so there was a group of us that came together to mm -hmm. form an organization called Latin 19, mm -hmm. and it's multiple stakeholders uh, from community and academic perspectives that have come together to really address those. And one of the things that we've been working hard with is with our actual healthcare system. Because back to the point I mentioned before, the Latinx community has really high uninsurance rates. And so they don't typically access care at Duke. Only 4% of the patients at Duke identify as Hispanic or Latino. But during the pandemic, there was a time where the majority of the patients in the ICU were Latinx. And so that system wasn't designed for them. And um, a lot of it took a lot of consultation with them to try to kind of redesign that system so that it met the needs of the population. Is it different now? I mean, now we have this Delta surge, what's happening? Well, there, we're starting to see, you know, that there's been improvements definitely in the level of the disparities, right? Um, unfortunately, we're still having a lot of cases But the overrepresentation of the Latinx community in those cases in our area is not as pronounced as it was before. It's still high. It's still higher than the population. It's about like 20% versus 14% of the population. But it wasn't that drastic 80% that we were looking at before. And, and I think that the, the health system, we have a lot, a long way to go, but the health system now participates in our Latin 19 calls. And they're hearing from the community what's going on. And so they're able to res be more responsive to those needs. And are you seeing, for example, in vaccination rates, is there, are there still disparities? Yeah, yeah, there was, there was major disparities in vaccination rates. So we saw the same story play out with everything, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, dis the disparities first in the, in the cases of COVID. Then when testing was available, Then there was disparities in access to testing. We, we advocated for testing sites to be opened in the part of town where the Latinx and Black communities lived because at first they were all clustered in the white community. And you could literally draw a line in the map of Durham and see the difference in the access to testing. And then when vaccines came, again, we saw initially there was underrepresentation of the Latinx community and the African-American Black community in that as well. And so we've been working very hard to address that. And, you know, we're very happy to see that currently right now, this is not true for all parts of the country or all parts of the state, but in our own region where we've been doing a lot of work, we have seen that narrowing of the gap in vaccine uptake in the Latinx community. So currently we're represented at the same proportion as our population. 
one area or one group of、um, patients or people that you haven't, well, I haven't heard that much in the media about,、um, are the orphans. And we hear about、mm-hmm. the skyrocketing numbers of of people dying. You know, now more than the Spanish flu、uh, almost a century ago. But what is happening with with orphans, children who've lost one or both parents, and are there disparities amongst children of different groups, and how do we deal with that? I would imagine that there's really profound disparities in that because from the beginning we know that the mortality rates in the Black community and the Latinx community was much higher. So who are the orphans that are there that 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 have been most affected by the pandemic? They're they're going to be these groups of children.、Mm-hmm. So that's very concerning. And then you also add in. The loss of parents, where where there's also, you know, systemically the likelihood of having access to resources, family members that can help, or access to educational resources or、um, financial resources.、Uh, we know that systemically, for many reasons, that there's lower educational attainment, lower access to income, lower access to good jobs in. Minoritized groups, and so you put a child who has lost their parents within the context of a society that really drives these inequities. Then you can imagine how disproportionately impacted these children will be. And we know very well from the whole work that has been done with adverse childhood experiences that these experiences of loss and adversity have a real profound impact not only on the future mental health. Of these individuals, but that gets under the skin and contributes to biological disparities that emerge in physical health consequences in the future. Is anybody doing the the research now to that will you know drive the policy changes that need to be put in place to make sure that you know we mitigate these negative consequences? Your question is a really important one because I don't think we've talked enough about it. Yeah, and so I have only started to see. A recognition of the impact that this might have for this segment of our community. I just see mental health problems f- emerging for everyone here, right?、Mm. the The people that have experienced loss in their family, the people that are working to address the health needs of people. There's extreme burnout.、Mm-hmm. We're hearing a lot from our community health workers that have been big leaders in addressing disparities. In this area, how burned out they are, and how, you know, that stress we know contributes to many mental health problems, and then ultimately, that stress contributes to physical health problems.、And、one of the things that we've been studying in our study of、uh, stress and resilience in the Latinx community is really how does that experience of stress. Acculturation stress, and now we have on pandemic stress.、Mm-hmm. We have this pandemic stress that has added to、mm-hmm. pre-existing stress, and how does that not only contribute to mental health outcomes, which we're we're studying for sure, but how does that get under the skin and contribute to stress biomarkers that ultimately have an impact on your physical health outcomes? So I think we're going to see. Obviously, some immediate mental health problems now, and then some long-term mental health problems and long-term physical health problems that result from this experience. Going back to these, this theme of culture and the impact of of culture and race on health indicators, one of the things that was really interesting for me in a recent、uh, episode with、uh, Dr. Phyllis Sharps. From Johns Hopkins, who's done a lot of work also on intimate partner violence, and in her case, the impact it has on maternal mortality and child mortality, infant mortality in the United States, she said something that really took me aback: that inter- intimate partner violence within the African American community is one of the driving factors behind the really high rates of、uh, maternal mortality. And then I was looking at some of the work that you've done. And in the research that you've done, the studies or the the statistics that you cite, the rates of intimate partner violence 
amongst Hispanic Latino communities in the United States is actually either on par or higher than African American communities. But then when you look at the maternal mortality rates, uh, you find something that's almost a paradox because the maternal mortality rates amongst Hispanic Latino women is actually the lowest in terms of the major ethnic groups in the states. So what is behind that? How come high rates of intimate partner violence within Latino communities has not translated into higher rates of maternal mortality as is happening with African-American women? Yeah, this is this is such a good question. It's so complex. Mm. It's very <laughs> multilayered. I'm going to try my best to try to get start deepening a little bit of our understanding around this, but there's a lot more to be discovered. Mm -hmm. First, there's cultural differences in intimate partner violence and how it occurs. Mm -hmm. So typically during pregnancy, you're at higher risk of victimization of intimate partner violence. And that's something that we see across populations, that during pregnancy, if you, particularly if you've already had an experience of intimate partner violence during pregnancy, that goes up. Mm -hmm. And for many people, that's where it begins. In the Latinx community, you see the opposite. During pregnancy, intimate partner violence goes down and is lower than moments outside of pregnancy. So there's something about pregnancy and the culture and the way that that is viewed culturally that is a protective factor for women that are pregnant and intimate partner violence. Hmm. So that's one thing is a, a difference. The other thing is that we have this immigrant paradox where immigrants in general, Latinx immigrants, African immigrants, they're healthier when they first come to the United States than when they spend time more time here, when they become more Americanized, and then across generations. And you see that particularly true with maternal mortality and infant mortality. So if you compare infant mortality among Latinx immigrants and African immigrants to U.S. born individuals, there's lower rates of maternal mortality and infant mortality. That's a paradox, right? Because typically the way this country has treated immigrants and then also you think about the struggles that immigrants face, yeah. that it just doesn't make, make sense. Mm -hmm. But when you start seeing, you know, first generation, second generation, third generation, that protective effect is, is dissolved, particularly with a third de generation, an African immigrant is no longer an African immigrant. They're an African American. Mm -hmm. Their infant mortality and mortality and maternal mortality rates are the same as African Americans. Wow! So it's really profound. So there's that there's that intersection there for the Latinx community. Is I think largely the, the one of the reasons why we see such lower maternal and infant mortality rates in the Latino community is because we still have a large segment of our population that are immigrants. Okay. Now, if you if you separate the groups, which is very important to separate groups according to heritage, mm -hmm. you see a very different story. So on one end, you have Mexican women that have very low infant mortality rates. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have Puerto Rican women that have very high infant mortality rates. They're, they're not as close. They're not quite as bad as the African-American Black community in general, but they're very close to those rates. And so that, again, begs a question about what about this exposure to, to the stress here in this country that is contributing to these disparities that we're seeing. So mm. in my work, I, I try to really leverage the strengths that the Latinx immigrant community comes and focus on not only let's prevent all the stress that's going to happen, but let's make sure that these wonderful strengths that you bring with you, that give you an advantage, don't disappear with time, that they're maintained. And, they, and, and we have found that these resilience factors like family support, like optimism and hope for the American dream, when those things exist, even if you're struggling, it's a protective effect against your mental health because you still have that context. Another part of my question about, you know, the 
difference between the African American and Latino com- um, experience with maternal health and IPV. What can other groups learn from this? Like, how do we get African American families to uh, regain some of that protective, aspirational qualities, if you will, if those are what what are making sure that maternal uh, mortality rates are low, infant mortality rates are lower. How do we then work with those communities so that they are empowered? I think that the African-American Black community will certainly know what they need. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is that our systems have not been responsive to that. And so... Well, while I think it's important to continue for us to focus on individuals and how to reduce individual family risk for intimate partner violence, we need to address the systems that are driving that, you know, and and we started off our conversation today, partly about images that we're seeing in the in the border around, you know, and then what that means, particularly to black men. Yes. What, what does that communicate to people? And so I think that's where we need to start is, is, is we really need to reshape the experience that Black men have. I want to dig a little further with something you said earlier. You mentioned the stress that comes with acculturation as being one of the driving uh, forces for uh, intimate partner violence. To measure that, do you do research in the home communities, like where people have come from, to see what are the rates for intimate partner violence? What would the situation be like without this move to the United States? And then also, have you done any studies on like comparing what's happening here versus other countries that people migrate to? I'm very interested in that work. Most of my work has been with people living here that have already immigrated here in the United States. And we do know that that we have found that with the longer you've lived here in the United States, Mm -hmm. the younger you come when you're a kid, the younger you're here, higher levels of acculturation and higher levels of acculturation stress. The stress of it is the main thing. We do see higher rates of intimate partner violence. So recent immigrants report lower rates of intimate partner violence than people that have lived here for more time. Going back to this immigrant paradox that you, we see the same pattern with maternal mortality. We have a very comprehensive measure of acculturation stress Mm -hmm. that was developed with a lot of input from people across the United States of Latinx populations, immigrants and non-immigrants, U.S. born individuals as well that helped inform this this very complex measure. And it has 90 questions. So we're very grateful that our participants answer these questions because it, it involves a, a good amount of investment of their time. But when they're answering that question, they really like the questions because they, they're questions that they're surprised someone could ask them. They feel like they feel like they're understood. So one of them, like I'll just give you an example. Every time we ask someone this, they like they they laugh almost like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you asked me that specific question, you know. And there's a question in the this um, measure is called the Hispanic Stress Inventory, mm-hmm. and we use an immigrant version of it. We assess gaps in acculturation levels between parents and children because that's a big source of stress. And so we ask the parents about conflict around their children going to sleepovers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? yes. It's like it's a, it's like not a normative thing and then yes. and then and then now the kids want to go to sleepovers. They're the only one in their in their friend group that can't go to sleepovers. That's contributing to that kid's stress, right? Because it's like why is my family different? Yes. Why can't I be like everyone else? Absolutely. Which then in turn translate to well I'm different. I'm not like everyone else. That means I'm not as good. Mm. Right. And then that just, you know, yes. causes a bunch of health problems, mental health problems and physical health problems. So those those questions and, and really it goes back to also the culturally specific nature of things, how important that is. Mm. And let's now pivot to like the role of nurses in all of this. How important is it to have those service providers, and in particular nurses, psychiatric and mental health nurses, uh, in enough numbers to address these issues, these uh, disparities and, and negative health outcomes? 
Well, I do think that is important for us to think about the nursing workforce in this area because we really do provide a unique perspective, which is that holistic integrated perspective of integrating for us, you know, we don't have that separation of mental health and physical health, right? There's you know, there's an, a perspective of integration of that. And our even our roles in as providers, you know, I'm, I'm more of a public health, mental health nurse, right? I focus more on prevention. Okay. But my, my colleagues that are in psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, their, their training allows them to be able to take advantage of the full gamut of what we know works to prevent and to treat mental health problems, both medicines and psychotherapy and other approaches. So they're, a, they're in a unique position to make an impact in particular. And unfortunately, because of the underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minority groups in nursing, we often don't have as much of a provider workforce that is reflective of the communities that we need to be taking care of, caring of. And we know that matters when there's racial and ethnic concordance between providers and the patients. We know that the health outcomes of those patients are better. So what should be done now? How are we going to increase the number of nurses from ethnic minority groups? Well, I think first we need to eliminate some of the barriers that we have for racial and ethnic minorities to accessing education, right? So unfortunately, sometimes where we have the places, uh, the academic centers that are going to produce the best psychiatric mental health nurses, Mm -hmm. they're not often in the places where we have um, racial minority groups living in, or in times that we do, the academic health centers don't often do a great job reaching out to those communities and, and, and really sharing the opportunities that exist in nursing in these roles. So we need to really address that big barrier around access to education. And then also, you know, in the, the Latinx community, one of the things that we experience is that because many people view nurses from the lens of what nurses do in their countries of origin. Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately, in some countries, they, nurses are not practicing in their full scope of what they're able to do and, and often are not recognized and valued by society. I would say we've changed that here in the United States. We still have a lot more to go. So a lot of gifted people that are interested in healthcare they're persuaded to pursue other professions rather than nursing. And I think we lose a lot of potential people that would be great nurses because of that, because of the image of what nurses do. And we haven't always been the best in communicating that to the public. That leads me on to my next question about your involvement with the Institute of Medicine's 2015 Future of Nursing report. Yeah. It was the 2010 uh, Institute of Medicine um, Future of Nursing Report. And that was a wonderful opportunity for me to be part of a group that I think has had a big impact on the nursing profession and um, has really started, laid the foundation to issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion that were really, really just the primal focus of this last report, which I was so pleased to see. Because I saw in that 10-year gap of when I had the opportunity to be part of this committee to where we are now, that the committee is focusing on health equity as the main thing is just a wonderful testimony of how nursing has evolved and um, focusing on things that are really critical to promoting health in general. So I was very delighted to see that. There was a lot of an impact that that initial report had on increasing the educational training, the diversity of nurses, and certainly uh, increasing the ability of all nurses, including advanced practice nurses, to practice to their full scope of practice and training. And so during the last 10 years, we've been keeping an eye on the states that have really expanded 
the scope of practice for advanced practice nurses. And there has been incredible improvements in the number of states that now allow advanced practice nurses to practice independently without the supervision of a physician. So we've made great headway in that that particular recommendation. There's still a lot long way to go, um, but but we have had some traction. And it's been, you know, it's been interesting to see how what's driving these decisions is really not evidence-based uh, decisions, right? Because when you look at the evidence base, there's overwhelming support demonstrating that advanced practice nurses have the same outcomes than primary care physicians. And sometimes they have even better outcomes as it relates to patient satisfaction because nurses, you know, do a great job connecting and Absolutely. building trust. So, so unfortunately, that data doesn't often influence the decision makers to make those changes. It's maybe some other things like interest groups and, and, and those kinds of things. So we still have a long way to go to really be able to reach those goals, but we've made, certainly made some good progress. Tell me about your experience with the SAMHSA Minority Fellowship Program, how you got appointed and the impact that it's had on, on your scholarship and your career. It's had such an important impact. And the way that it started was that an alumni of the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, MFP program, um, reached out to me and he encouraged me to apply for this. And so Elias Vasquez, uh, who is now a dean in uh, the University of Colorado in Denver, and he's also a Latino nurse scientist, which I hadn't had a lot of exposure to in my career. You know, I didn't have um, many opportunities to see Latino Latinx health scientists. So he he influenced me in a profound way in that I saw him and, you know, similar to what you shared about the group of nurses that were male nurses going out and doing outreach, you see him and I said, oh, you know what, I can do this too. I may be able to fit in. If he fits in, I may be able to fit in in a profession that doesn't really look very much like me or sound like me or dress like me. Um, so he um, he was very important. And um, and then once I, I, I started being part of the fellowship, then, of course, then I, I got introduced to many colleagues and leaders in nursing that were more reflective of the way I saw myself. I saw my, you know, I saw myself fitting in more. And so on top of the incredible training they provided to me, they provided me so much training in not only substance abuse and mental health, but in also statistics that's really foundational to being a, a successful nurse scientist. Mm-hmm. So that, that training opportunity was, I would say I got more out of that, the statistics I learned through the MFP than I did in my own PhD program. Right. Is that Dr. Yorandi? <laughs> yes, Dr. Yorandi. Yeah. And so that, that really helped me. Mm-hmm. And it really, when I first started to do this work, I was interested in more of HIV only. And because of the substance abuse and mental health perspective of things, I was interested in HIV and intimate partner violence, the intersection. And then exposure to substance abuse and mental health really, you know, pushed me to think about my work from a syndemic perspective, which is these co-occurring epidemics that exist. Um, and that really is has shaped my research profoundly. My, my research is now focused on this syndemic. And, and so that was profound. The other thing that has been great is that I've had two of my mentees that have... Um, that, you know, that I've encouraged to apply to to this. And so right now I'm currently with a PhD student. Her name is Lisville Matos, and she's a MFP scholar right now. And so I've had an opportunity to continue to sustain, you know, our, our right. family here. And, w- and why is that important for you to continue, like, to pay it forward, if you will? I, well, first of all, I feel like I, I received so much from this that I, I want to, I feel a sense of gratitude to the program and I want to make sure that I provide 
you know, my own contributions to the program. The other thing is that it, it did so much for me that I want to make sure that other people have access to that, those same opportunities that I, I had because of the fellowship. You know, the fellowship program every year, there are maybe 30, 40, 50 people in this program. So it's, it's really an exclusive group. But there are surely a lot of potential fellows out there who could benefit from the type of uh, support that you receive through the fellowship program. So what advice would you give to nurse educators, uh, people who are in nursing programs, who are interested in and who would like to make a difference for nurse scholars that are from ethnic minorities? How, what can they do to make their institutions a more nurturing space for ethnic minority scholars? Well, I think that the, the, the first thing that we need to do is on a superficial level, is really focus on diversifying our student body and diversifying our faculty and staff at these academic institutions. And we need to be doing that while at the same time making sure that our environment is inclusive, mm. right? Because we may be able to do more harm than good if we and focus on diversifying and then we bring people from racial and ethnic minority groups into an environment where they don't feel like they belong, mm. right? So I think we have a long way to go for racial and ethnic minorities to feel like they belong in academic institutions. I certainly did not feel like I belonged when I first started. And there is a lot of aspects of myself that I minimized. So, you know, I held back, wasn't truly myself because of that. And, and we know that there's a cost to that when we could all be truly ourselves that's when we're the most productive and that's when we can contribute the most. And you think it was because of race or because of your background that you held back? I think for a number of reasons. I think my age, when I started in academia, I was 25 years old and that's when I taught my first class. So I was young and then I, I didn't look like the majority white faculty that were teaching. So, you know, I had questions of like, am I smart enough to be doing this, right? So I remember I used to put my hair in a bun and wear glasses and not let my curls come out, right? <laughs> so it's it's like, you, you know, that stress of, 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 we call it imposter syndrome, right? We, there's a word for it mm -hmm. that is, is present in all of us, right? But it's particularly pronounced in people where on top of your sense of qualifications, when there's a tag to you, whether it's your ethnicity or your gender identity or other tag, you know, that adds to that, yes. that imposter syndrome. So we, we, we really need to, to show different models, you know, of what being a nurse looks like and a, a nurse leader and a nurse scientist. We need to show different diverse models of what that look like so that people can feel more comfortable um, in those spaces. And so what is your advice for fellows who are now going through the program um, and for those who recently graduated? What should they be looking out for in terms of maximizing what they get out of this program? Yeah, I would say to really take advantage of all the resources, the people, the network and the educational opportunities that the fellowship has. And part of that taking advantage of, of those things is not only just being present physically present, but really be totally mentally present in those activities, right? So like throw yourself in them and, in, you know, engage yourself totally in them. For me, I think one of the things that was very helpful that I learned a lot about was my interactions with my fellows, with my colleagues. I learned so much about identity, culture, racially based disparities from my colleagues in the program, the other fellows. I remember there was this one experience that I had that was really profound that opened my eyes tremendously. And I think about it very, very regularly today in my work that I do yeah. with different racial and ethnic groups. And that was an experience we we had a uh, an intensive institute that was focused on policy on translating research into policy and impact. And we did that in Washington, DC. And part of it 
Uh, I think the MFP does an excellent job of combining the experiential parts of learning with also more of the formal traditional types of learning like lectures and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So my roommate, which is African-American, and I were walking through the Library of Congress and we went up to a wall and there was this fresco on the wall. And the fresco on the wall says something like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and just it had words like justice and freedom and all these things. And I look at that wall from the perspective of daughters of immigrants that fled Cuba where there was no freedom, right? And there was no liberty. And because my parents made that sacrifice, I was able in my mind to experience those things. So when I stopped at that wall and I looked at it, I... I shared um, with my roommate, I was like, this is, I feel so proud to be an American and see that from the very inception of this country, these words were put on the wall. She looks at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who <laughs> built this wall? Like enslaved people build this wall, yeah. right? And we're talking about life, liberty, pursuit of happiness and justice. What, what, you know, how absurd does that sound? Right. Yeah, so that has really helped me so much because, you know, it, it, working, it, you know, groups have very diverse experiences and people have very diverse perspectives. And so if we want to really do work and advancing health equity, it's really important for us to be knowledgeable about not only our own group's experience, but other, other groups that have been historically marginalized and oppressed in this country. Absolutely. Um, very important. Maybe we can tap it a little bit more into your experience and expertise to get some advice for the Minority Fellowship Program, especially in light of the expanding or the growing Latino population in, in the United States, Latinos being the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population, what strategies would you recommend that the MFP pursue to gain more visibility amongst Latino nursing students? So I think that leveraging the graduates that are Latino to be able to go and speak about the program and the impact that it's had on their lives. I think many people just have not heard about it. Right. So I think the, the alumni network is probably the, the, the best resource that we, that the program could tap into to be able to, to, to speak to. I think part of the problem though, is this issue of, of what in the Institute of Medicine or the National Academy of Medicine 2020 report, they call the diversity tax. Mm -hmm which is the, the added roles and responsibilities of uncounted work that you have as a minority in nursing and, and promoting engagement of other minorities. So, you know, I think there's such few Latino faculty and such few Latino uh, nurse scientists that there's a big burden that's placed on us in trying to engage our own community. I think everyone's really invested in doing that work, but, and I think it should be done, but we also have to think of how, how do we support our faculty in doing that work? How do we re reduce the load of other work that they're doing or so that we can really facilitate that kind of engagement? I also think of, the, of doing more and being more present and Janet Jackson has always been excellent at doing this, is really being present at the organizational meetings. So the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, I often see her there, you know, so we need to just continue to do those kinds of things. And then we need to go to schools, I think, where we do see a larger percentage of Latino nurse nursing students to make sure that those schools are aware of, of this program. But the, you just mentioned something about reducing the burden on nurse scholars, on minority nurse scholars. You are very busy and looking at the number of papers that you've published, your engagements, your, you know, it's quite incredible. The accomplishments are, are a lot. But how do you maintain your focus? Because it takes focus to begin something, something as, you know, as complex as a research program, uh, you know, taking it from the grant level all the way through, you know, multi-year studies, etc. How do you maintain your focus? How do you balance work and life? 
uh, and maintain your passion for, for nursing? I would say that I don't always maintain my focus or I don't balance well sometimes, but okay. I always have passion. Okay. And I think that's what takes me through it. I'm very happy to be able to dedicate my, my career to addressing these important issues that I think are extremely important social issues that we need to solve. And I feel so fortunate to be able to be in a role that I can work and contribute to that. So my passion and love of the work that I do is really what balances me and keeps me motivated. Sometimes I lose my focus in the sense of there's so much work to be done that pulls me away from my research sometimes because you know, many things that are happening, we don't have time to do this, the research around mm. to address, right? So like in the COVID-19 pandemic, people in my community were dying and there was not a lot of people, a lot of healthcare providers that had deep connections with this community. And so I had to, I had to be, how can I not be part of that, right? I took me away from writing papers and writing grants and made my days longer, you know? but it was an important thing that I needed to be part of. I have three small children mm-hmm. and they balance me for sure because at the end of my day, when I'm with them, I do disconnect because I they're so engaging. Like, how can I not? Like they're so, choice, <laughs> they're yeah. so, they're so fun to be with and they're so engaging. And so um, I, I, they really do help me get my mind off things. Some of the things we work on are so, so heavy. So they make me help me get my mind off things. And so although it's more work, you know, trying to be an involved mom and then also a leader in my community and a nurse scientist and a good citizen of my university and school, it's a lot that adds on. But the diversity of those things and those roles for me really helped me because it's not like I'm doing the one thing all the time. I'm able to do a number of different things in different ways so that really does help me that is that's wonderful to hear especially since I know you are you have moved from your home environment where probably you would have had the extended family um, there to help with with that work-life balance but Dr. Gonzalez Guarda thank you very much for your time it's been a very wonderful conversation and I hope that there'll be a lot here for our listeners to learn from Thank you for the opportunity to really reconnect with the work that I'm doing and and talk about it. That's, you know, that's something that really does help me and, and continues to drive my passion I have for this work. And that does it for this episode of Mental Health Trailblazers, Psychiatric Nurses Speak Up. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion and I look forward to you joining us on future episodes. This is the Minority Fellowship Program at the American Nurses Association's podcast, featuring nurse scientists addressing the psychiatric and mental health issues affecting minority communities across America. You can always find us online at emfp.org or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. The Minority Fellowship Program is a SAMHSA grant-funded initiative. The views expressed by the speakers and hosts do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government.